so often when Jesus healed people, he touched them. But he knows his only hope is Jesus. And he comes and says, Son of David, have mercy on me. He says, Lord, if you can make me clean, falls down at Jesus' feet and all the crowd is shrinking back. And he touched him. He didn't need to touch him. He could have just spoken the word. It's like that centurion. He says, Lord, you don't even need to come. You've got authority. Speak the word and my servant will be healed. Daughter, your faith has made you well. And when God said, let there be land, let there be a firmament, let there be, and Jesus said, be, that was sealing it. The Word of God declared. And tonight's message, our final message in this series, is a touch of transformation. Uh, so often when Jesus healed people, he touched them. He didn't need to. You know, we sang a little song that was sort of impromptu a few minutes ago. Karen didn't know we were going to do that. And uh, she was probably back there fasting and praying. <laughs> and uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a word in there. It says, your touch is what I longed for. To have the touch of God. A leper came to Jesus, and Luke tells us the physician said he was full of leprosy, and that, of course, renders him unclean. And everybody saw this man full of leprosy coming towards Jesus, and he's violating the law that says you're supposed to keep your distance. But he knows his only hope is Jesus, and he comes and says, Son of David, have mercy on me. He says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Falls down at Jesus' feet, and all the crowd is shrinking back. They think he's hopeless. The crowd... They seem to factor into each one of these stories. But Jesus didn't run. And he said, I will be thou clean. And he touched him. He didn't need to touch him. He could have just spoken the word. It's like that centurion. He says, Lord, you don't even need to come. You've got authority. Speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus didn't have to touch that leper, but he touched him. Now, one of two things was going to happen. Either Jesus would become unclean by touching him or the man became clean from touching Jesus. So if you get the touch of the Lord, it's reverse polarity. He does not become defiled because he's already taken our sin. He gives us his righteousness. Amen. You know, there was a very, uh, it's a cool experiment that was performed in 1958 on affectionate response by a Dr. Harry Harlow, and they were trying to understand something about uh, how creatures respond to physical touch. So they took these baby Reese's monkeys, cute little monkeys, and as soon as they were born, they separated them from their mothers, and they put them in these cages. And in the cage, in one experiment anyway, they had a wire monkey. It was kind of like sculpted chicken wire monkey. And right about chest level, it had a bottle so the monkey could nurse. And they kept the room warm enough so the monkey would not be too cold. And then on the other side of the cage, in the same cage, they had another wire monkey, but it had like a terry cloth covering to it. So they thought, you know, what's the monkey going to want more? Is he going to want the food or is he going to want the touch? And the monkey, of course, would go to the one wire mother and drink, but whenever there was any threat, you know, they put a little mechanical bear in the cage and the little monkey screamed and he ran over to the cloth monkey. And whenever they introduced any kind of concern or fear, the monkey ran to the cloth. It was the touch that it wanted. Well, you know, as you might imagine, those monkeys, as they got a little older, they tried to introduce them to normal monkey populations, and they were totally mixed up. They just hugged themselves and rocked back and forth and didn't know how to interact. And without growing up with that sense of, of touch. So we're going to look at a story. One of the most important stories, I believe, in the Bible, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 5, and we'll be starting with verse 21, Mark 5, 21, and you find uh, various editions of this in some of the other um, synoptic gospels. Now, when Jesus crossed over again, here he is still ministering around Galilee, by boat to the other side a great multitude gathered about him. There's the crowd. And he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, 
And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. He may have even reached out and grabbed him by the feet, like Mary when he, she saw him resurrected. And Jesus said, do not detain me. Do not cling to me. He fell at his feet and he begged him. You remember the story of that um, Shunammite woman and the Bible says that Elisha, through a miracle, she gave birth, she had a son, but then the boy died. And she rode a donkey furiously across country to get to Elisha's house, and she came to Elisha, and she fell at his feet, and she grabbed him by the feet and would not let go. And when you have a child that is desperately sick, this father normally would have been, he's a ruler of the synagogue, you know, had a little dignity. He falls down at Jesus' feet. And he begged him, he's pleading earnestly with all of his heart. He's a desperate. And he said, my little daughter is at the point of death. She's going through labor breathing. She's been fading. She's one breath away from her last breath. He begs him, come, lay your hand on her, touch her, that she may be healed and she will live. So he's got faith. Now, how does Jesus respond when someone comes with faith? I can't overstate, mentioned it earlier today, the importance of coming to Christ in faith, even as Jesus hung on the cross, flanked by two other thieves. Both of those thieves ask to be saved. One will be, the other will not. What's the difference? One thing, one thief said, if you are the Christ, if you are the Christ, Save yourself and us. And the other one, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know how much is packed up in that? Did Jesus look like a Lord and a king that day, hanging on the cross, beaten and nearly naked? They called him Lord. He saw the sign above his head. This is the king of the Jews. He remembered Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His mind was quickened by the Holy Spirit. He heard Jesus say those words. He thought, this is the Savior. This is the King of Israel. And then it says in Psalm 22, they gambled for my clothing and they parted my garments among him. He saw them gambling for his clothing and all came together for him. And with total confidence, he said, Lord, remember me when, not if, you come into your kingdom. Jesus turned to that thief and he says, Verily I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Now they both wanted to be saved. One said, If. There's a father that brought a son to Jesus who was paralyzed. Or he, was, uh, he would go through fits of paralysis and the devil sometimes possessed him where he would have an attack and he'd fall in the fire or he'd fall in the water and he came to Jesus and said, Lord, I brought them to your disciples but they can't do anything. If you can do anything, help us. And Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. You said a dirty word. You know how Jesus identified the devil? When he came in the temptation, he said, if you're the son of God. Father says, Lord, if you can help me. Jesus said, wait, wait. If you believe, all things are possible. And then he said, I do believe. That's why I'm here. But I do have some doubts. Lord, help my unbelief. And Jesus healed his son. So at least if you come and confess your limited faith, if you've got faith like a grain of mustard seed, you can move mountains. And that includes mountains of sin. Amen. The Bible says you can say with faith, to this mountain be plucked up and cast in the midst of the sea, and it will be done. And the mountain we wrestle with it's not Mount Shasta or Mount Whitney or Mount Everest. It's a mountain of sin. God will take our sins and cast them into the depths of the sea. But you need faith. So the father came. You know what I love about this story? As with many stories in the Bible, I don't see too many examples in the Bible where Jesus was asked anything and he said no. One occasion, someone tried to get Jesus involved in some dispute over a will with their brother. He won't divide the money with me. Jesus said, look, I'm not a lawyer. And he didn't, no record did he help that guy. But everybody else that came with a legitimate concern, Jesus heard their prayer. Jesus is infinitely more willing to answer your prayers than we typically are to pray them. I think when we get to heaven, the angels are going to take us to a warehouse. It's just bursting over. We're going to say, what's that? 
They can say, that's all the answered prayers we wanted to send, but no one asked for them. <laughs> Wasted. Karen and I just came back from Taiwan, I mentioned, and uh, after, you know, when you get there, you got to sometimes convert your money. So we converted some money so we could get around, and then as we got out of the airport, we thought, oh, got 200 Taiwanian dollars we forgot to convert. Brought it back to the office. He said, it's worthless. He said, the banks won't take it. And I felt so bad, you know, I'm half Jewish. I just thought, oh man, all this money that I'm, <laughs> what am I going to do now? What a waste. I hate waste, don't you? Yes. And uh, I haven't told Karen yet, but I threw it in the garbage. I know, but that's a lot for me. <laughs> just think of everything we could have done with that. I it sat on my desk for two weeks. I thought, oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> I took it to the uh, office. I said, if we got anyone else going back to Taiwan, make sure and tell them about this six dollars that we've got. <laughs> and the treasurer said, Doug, just throw it away. I hate waste. Think of all the prayers that are wasted because we don't pray them. How many miracles God wants to perform for you, but you won't take that step of faith? This man came and he said, Lord, help my daughter. My little daughter, turns out she's 12 years old, touch her, she'll live. So Jesus went with him, and it mentions now for a second time, for a reason, a great multitude followed him and thronged him. He's being pressed in on every side and jostled and crushed. I, I won't hesitate to say this, but... Um, when Karen and I went to New Guinea a few years ago, I don't even remember what year that was, four, three, four years ago, and um, 60,000 people met us at the airport. A hundred and, that was in their newspaper, 150,000 people. We couldn't get through the crowd. And they had, and it was, it's amazing to me that, you know, here's so many poor people, but they're watching on their phones on the internet. You know, they live under a leaf somewhere, but they've got a phone and they're watching the programs. Seriously. And um, we couldn't get through the crowd. They had police cars and then they had deacons. I've never seen deacons that have the assignment. I want to say hi to my friends in New Guinea. They're going to be watching this, you know. And they had deacons that were assigned. They had switches to whip the church members to get out of the way. <laughs> New job description. Husband of one wife. Good with a whip. <laughs> just, and they're, they're going like this and the people are smiling and they're kind of getting out of the way and, but I've never seen anything like this isn't that right? we got it on tape and so when I hear these stories I mean and at one point as we're going by we had the window down because I want to you know, greet people as we're going by and they're just running up to the car and they're singing it was, we were in tears I'm telling you it was really really exciting even our camera guys were in tears and uh, we'd never seen anything like it and they're coming up the car and I'm trying to just put out my hand so I could touch them. But so many of them grabbed my hand at the same time and nearly took it off my at the elbow. <laughs> Finally, the president's in the car with us. He says, don't do that. <laughs> he, said, he said, open the window that much. <laughs> touch. Come and touch her. She'll live. But he's got this great throng. Now there's a certain woman and this story has another story buried in it. There is a certain woman that had a flow of blood for 12 years. This is that flow of blood that Leviticus 16 or 15 says would render you unclean. You could not go to the temple. Uh, you'd be considered cursed by God and separated. And she had this problem for 12 years. A continual flow of blood. And in her efforts to find some healing, she submitted to the treatment of many doctors. And I expect that sometimes that must have been humiliating. And she didn't get any better, but she grew worse. And she spent all that she had. She was drained in every way. She was anemic. She was discouraged. She was weak. She was broke. And she heard that Jesus was passing by. And she thought, if I can just get a touch from him, 
I could be healed. I could be reunited with my family. I could go back to church. I could come back into the presence of God. But there's a problem. It's that old crowd again is in the way. And she just can't get through. She'd like to talk to Jesus and kind of explain what the problem is, but she had a kernel of faith. She says, I'm obviously not going to get a private audience. Too much going on. But Jesus knew that there was someone in that crowd that had a special need. You know, it's always amazing to me. I remember when I was a kid, my mother tried to teach me to read Hebrew, and she sent me to the temple. I said, I can never read backwards. But I remember asking the rabbi, how does God hear everybody's prayers at the same time? You know, I was kind of an agnostic smart aleck back then. And the um, only reason my mother sent me to synagogue was to get back at my father because he sent me to Catholic school. So you know why I'm so mixed up, don't you? <laughs> it wasn't because either of them were religious. And so um, I thought, how does he hear prayers? But you know, God hears your prayer as though you're the only person that ever prayed. You have his undivided 100% attention when you pray. And Jesus, in spite of all that was going on and all the distractions of the crowd that day, he heard the plea of that woman's heart and it especially touched him. It's kind of like when he went by those five pools and he, there was all kinds of sick people, but there was one man that had been there 38 years and he could not get anyone to even help him into the pool. Jesus knew about that man, an especially desperate case. Perfect opportunity for him to demonstrate his mercy. So she's trying to get through the crowd and everyone's jostling him and Jesus got his disciples around him and then there's the, you know, the, the, the inner circle of his apostles that are doing block for him. And Jesus told Jairus, he says, okay, I'll go to your house. And they're painfully making their way up the street and every now and then people are coming out and they're, they're asking Jesus for a photograph or they're, you know, wanting a signature and, or, or they're saying, could you please, uh, you know, I got this prayer request or whatever it is. You know, he's, I used to wonder sometimes how Jesus was so graceful with so many people and that he didn't finally get, okay, guys, I'm tired now. I'm going home. It just seemed like he worked until he fell over in the boat and fell asleep. He loved people. And she thought, I may not get to talk to him, but I believe that he's such a holy man that if I could just touch the hem of his garment... Now, a lot of rabbis back then, there's no proof of exactly what Jesus wore, but a lot of the Pharisees, a lot of the rabbis, a lot of the scribes and the holy men, they would wear a border of blue. You didn't have to be a professional. Any loyal Israelite could do it. That border of blue on the garments, that was to remind them of the word and the law of God, loyalty to the law of God. And so it's very possible that Jesus on his garment, he had a border of blue, as symbolizing for the word of God, the promises of God. And so she decided, I'm not letting him get away. And she's pushing through the crowd and she's trying to make her way to the front. And others are pushing her back and say, we were here first. And you know, women didn't get the same kind of respect that they get today. And so she's jostling through the crowd and finally she sees an opening and she sees him and she sees his clothes and she gets there through all this forest of legs and he's passing by because the Bible says that when she finally touches him. She evidently, he's on his way past her. He, she reaches through the crowd. She lunges and she just gets the hem of his garment. But that's all it takes. You know, there's a place in the Bible. It says that when Peter was healing, they would take handkerchiefs from Peter and he would bless them. And Now, I wouldn't recommend this today, but... Uh, that's right, they would take hankies from Peter. He'd bless them and they'd bring it to the sick person and then they were healed. I was once, uh, I don't know how I got on the mailing list, but this televangelist, he sent out this envelope to me asking for a donation. He says, I've sent you a holy prayer cloth that I've blessed. I thought this should be interesting. <laughs> That's how I opened it up. I won't say his name. I'm real tempted. And... Uh, <clears throat> And he said, so I opened it up and he said, there's a letter in there and it says, I've sent you a holy prayer cloth that I prayed over and God is going to answer your prayers. All you have to do is by faith now reach in your wallet or purse and take out the largest bill you have, wrap it up in the prayer cloth 
and send it back to me. And so I'm looking through the envelope for the prayer cloth. I saw this extra piece of paper and I'm going, where's my prayer cloth? And then I looked and I saw they had Xerox, a piece of tapestry on a piece of paper and said, this is your prayer cloth. You know, place your money here. I thought, man, some people believe that. I used to think televangelists were the lowest form of life in the world because of things like that. And then I became one. You know, it's kind of sad. <laughs> but hopefully we don't, we, don't, we don't go that far. But it does say in the Bible they would take these cloths from the apostles and people would, through faith, they'd be healed. So she thought, if I can just get the hem of his garment. And she reaches out and it says, if I could but touch it, I'll be made well. And immediately, power and virtue go surging through her body and strength, her color returns. She knows instantly within her that she has been healed. Amen. She felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power, dunamis, dynamite, virtue had gone out of him, he turns around in the crowd and he said, who touched my clothes? <laughs> now you got to you know, repicture what's going on here. The Bible just said twice there's a great multitude and he's being thronged and the streets are narrow and they're pushing and jostling him so they're probably nearly lifting him off the ground. And for him to look around at the apostles and say, who touched my clothes? <laughs> they're thinking, well, we knew he'd snap eventually. <laughs> the pressure's finally got to him. It could be the heat. He could be low blood sugar. But when Jesus said, who touched my clothes? The disciples are kind of mystified by what he's saying. And uh, they said to him, you see the ma multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And Jesus stops. Now he's moving up the street and all of a sudden he stops and it's like this, boom, everybody stops and they all have rear end collisions with each other as going up the street. And he's like, he says, look, I'm not going any further. And he said it loud enough. She hadn't gotten away yet. I think just after she touched him, notice how quickly this happens. She immediately receives a miracle Amen. because she said, if I could but touch him. And he stops and says, who touched me? And knowing that someone did it, and she hears the conversation, he says, no, someone has touched me. And this is the voice of God. And when God says, Adam, where are you? You better answer. <laughs> and when Jesus said, who touched me? Now, she was probably terrified. It says, but the woman fearing and trembling. She was terrified. Knowing what had happened to her. She said, oh no, maybe I, I was supposed to get in line, get a number. <laughs> he might take it back. <laughs> Did I do something wrong? She's terrified. She's also not really excited about explaining the whole story. You weren't supposed to be in this crowd because you're unclean. What are you doing here? See what I'm saying? fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her. She came and fell down before him and she told him the whole truth. The reason you got the story in the Bible is because she shared her testimony. Now after, after the Lord performs a miracle for you, you've got your first sermon. Everybody ought to be able to share a story. If you've been saved, then you got something to say. And it might be, I was lost and now I'm found. I was dead and now I'm alive. I met Jesus and he saved me. It might be short. In our evangelism training program, we tell everybody, first sermon you can preach, everybody can preach is, what did Jesus do for you? It doesn't matter if you've been in the church all of your life. You need to have a testimony Amen. that you know you're saved and that you've had an experience with the Lord. Now some say, well, Pastor Doug, I never saw light on the road to Damascus. It doesn't mean that. Have you made a decision to save Jesus? Have you accepted that forgiveness? That should bring a peace into your life and give you a purpose and a power. And you just tell them that you've got the joy. And if you don't have that story, well, you need to get on your knees and ask him for it. Because Christians should have a story to tell. And Jesus said, don't you go slinking off. Tell, give glory to God. Tell what he's done for you. Jesus heals the demoniac. He says, oh Lord, I want to ride around with you in the boat. You and the apostles. Just sail around, you and me and the apostles. And Jesus said, no, I, I didn't save you to do that. I saved you so you can go tell what God has done for you. And so he went everywhere telling what Jesus had done for him. 
After Peter is saved from prison, Acts chapter 12, you know the first thing he does? He goes to church and he tells the story of how God saved him from prison. Had you been saved from prison? How many of you will admit you're sometimes afraid to share your faith? My hand's up. You know, I am not as afraid talking to you in a setting like this. If you ask me to go knock on doors, I'm scared. I mean, I, I like to be liked. I'm always afraid of rejection. I used to do door-to-door -door sales. I wasn't selling Christian things. I was selling meat. <laughs> Doug Batchelor's prime beef steaks and to just go cold knocking on doors and have the door slammed in your face. And I was scared. And I really respect, I've got great admiration for some of these people that are fearless. We've got people that teach that part of our program that do better than me. Knocking on doors. These cold porters, they're fearless. How many of you remember in gathering? I don't know whatever happened. It doesn't happen much anymore, but <laughs> I've been out in gathering with some saints that were at Karen's grandma. She was bold. She'd knock on the door and she had a little plastic purse so they could see through that there was money in the purse so they'd know why she was there. She'd stand there, sweet old lady. She'd knock on the door and, and they'd come to her and she'd put her foot in the door. She says, we're here to sing Christmas songs for you and we were taking donations and she was, I knew one dear lady, she lived to 105. She'd look through the window to see if anybody was home. <laughs> and we'd say, sister, don't do that. You know, this is in a country where they all got shotguns. <laughs> she'd knock on the door and if they didn't answer the door, she'd try the doorknob. <clears throat> she was brave. She said, I know they want us to sing for them. <laughs> Who wouldn't want that? God's given some of these people that courage. So she came fearing and trembling. You don't need to be afraid. Jesus didn't want to take it away from her. He wanted to bless her. She fell down before him and told the whole truth. He said, daughter. You notice? Again, immediate adoption. Amen. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Amen. Go in peace. Don't be afraid. Be healed. Now, when God says be anything, you know how the world came into existence? God said, let there be light. And when that leper came to Jesus, he said, Lord, if you want to make me clean, you can make me clean. He says, I will be thou clean. Amen. And when God said, let there be land, let there be a firmament, let there be, and Jesus said, be. That was sealing it. Amen. The Word of God declared that she was clean, and he said, I am also calling you a daughter. And this has all happened because of my great faith. Is that what Jesus said? Yeah. Show me where in the Bible Jesus healed someone. He says, my faith has made you whole. Nowhere. The Bible tells us that God has dealt to all men a measure of faith. Amen. And it is absolutely crucial that you learn to trust God. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him, believe, have faith in Him, should not perish. If you have faith in Him, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. It's crucial. He said, your faith. Now, I, I tell you, faith is an amazing thing. There's a power. Uh, even the world has understood that there's something to be said for what you might even call positive thinking. I'll tell you, it's true. If you believe so often when a person experiences success, then uh, it's like Christ said, be it unto you according to your faith. I think God honors faith in people. Some may not even be Christians, but they move forward with a certain amount of confidence and belief and purpose. And the Lord says, I'm going to bless your faith. Even though they may not have everything else right, I believe there's some people that have gone to healing services, and the, the evangelist might even be a sham. I know someone that I believe was sincere. They said, I went to a healing service of an evangelist. I won't say their name. They were later exposed as just a real scoundrel. But this person says, I went in faith, and I came forward, and I was healed, and I'm still healed today. Amen. It wasn't the evangelist's faith. God can speak through a donkey. Amen. Isn't that right? Amen. It was their faith in Christ. So some people think, oh, I've got to go find the right preacher to heal me. No, you don't. Jesus is the preacher. Amen. You need faith in Him. Amen. I learned a lesson about this years ago, the power of faith. And you know, you know what the placebo effect is. Even science, atheists understand 
that there's something about the way that humans are designed that if we have enough confidence, what's happening up here can affect healing other places in the body. So whenever they test some new medicine, they found so many people got well from artificial medicine, we don't know if it's really the medicine or their faith in the supposed medicine that's healing them. So whenever they approve a new medicine, they do a placebo test also. They give people a phony one to see if they have the same degree of healing. I know for years they used to perform a procedure called the Malmary um, um, incision where they tie off some arteries to get rid of agina. Malmary ligation. And um, Dr. Cobb, I think, first introduced it. People had agina pain, they'd make an incision, they'd tie off some arteries and they got rid of the, the uh, angina pain, the little arteries. And um, then one guy got a little suspicious and he said, I'm going to do some placebo tests. I'm going to pretend I'm performing the procedure, make the incision, sew them up and say, you should feel much better. And they found out just as many people said they felt better from the phony process as the real one. There's some people that had warts and they painted their warts with just a plain old dye and they said this is a power for wart removing medication and the people believed it and half of them lost their warts. <laughs> They've got all, all, a whole series of tests I can tell you about that oh, they did something where uh, they did a test people that were struggling with asthma and they said, uh, we've got this very powerful bronchiodilator. Inhale this and it'll help you breathe freely. Your lungs will open up and you'll breathe freely. And they told them this and they had faith and they had a laboratory all clean and they had faith in doctors. They really had faith that this is going to work. And they'd come in wheezing and they'd, they'd give them this, it was salt water with some flavoring or something. So they think it's powerful medicine. They'd inhale it and they'd go, oh, much better, thanks. Praise the Lord. <laughs> There's nothing in it. And so doctors have been mystified by this power of faith. I learned a lesson about this. Years ago, my dad put me on a, a school that was on a boat. And it sailed around the um, Mediterranean. And I was a young hippie. And I was using drugs back then and drinking and uh, being a pretty bad character. And when I got on board, I started school late. All the other kids were there. And I kind of joined late in the season. And... Um, they kind of frisked you and they took all your drugs away when you, you went. The school's on a boat. Politicians and millionaires used to send their kids there to get them out away from drugs and some of the problems they were getting in, try and straighten them out. And uh, after I was there, um, I realized a lot of the other kids were, you know, coming from the same background as me. And um, I used to use LSD. Uh, not a lot, so I don't want you to think that's where my vision has come from. <laughs> But I did use LSD. <laughs> Pastor Doug joined Amazing Facts and had a flashback. That's the thing God, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and LSD comes in one form. It's called window pane. They're just little bitty squares, about a quarter inch. It's thin. It looks like a thin little piece of plastic. And you put it in your mouth, it dissolves. And it's got d surgery, the ethyl 25 in there. And it'll, it's very dangerous. It'll make you hallucinate. And, and um, one of my friends, Eric, he was what we called an acid head. And he said, oh, Doug, man, you, got, you bring any acid with you when you came from Florida? I said, no. I said, and then, you know what? I realized I used to go to concerts. I'd buy it, and I'd put it in my wallet in my little picture holders because you could hide it there from the police because it looks like plastic. And, and when I went back to my room, I thought, oh, no, I don't have any. I checked my wallet, but then I got an idea. You know, we were so desperate for good food, and the, the medium of exchange on this boat was Snickers candy bars. We'd do anything. We'd trade each other for Snickers candy bars. We were sailing around Italy. There's nothing American except Snickers candy bars. And you know those little picture holders in your wallet? I got a pair of scissors, and I cut two of those <laughs> quarter inch by quarter inch. And I told Eric one day, I said, okay, come to my room. He came to my room. I waited until I was alone said, you're never going to believe what I found in my wallet, which was true. It's where I found it. <laughs> and I said, I've got, I've got two hits of LSD. Oh, me and Frank, said, I said, I don't want to seem too eager. I said, I'll sell you one of them for one, now two. I thought I can only do this once. Two Snickers candy bars. All right. So he comes, he gives me the candy bars. And as he's leaving my room, I give him this little piece of square plastic, you know. I said, now this is not the kind that dissolves in your mouth. This is the kind you just swallow it. You just... <laughs> and he was, you know, he's a 
He didn't know any better. <laughs> and so he takes it, and then I, I ate my candy bars right away because I thought it won't be very long before he realized I just... <laughs> and I think I was a little sick. So um, the next morning, I hear on my cabin door, I knew it was coming. He comes in, he says, Doug, you know that acid that you sold me? So I took it last night, and he said, nothing happened. I said, oh yeah, and then he said, at first, he said, but then I woke up, and man, what a trip. And he, <laughs> he starts to tell me about all these patterns and things that he saw, the places he went, and I'm going, oh yeah. And, and he left my cabin, I ate the other one, thinking that maybe, <laughs> I thought, who knows? There could be some hallucinogenic properties in wallet sweat or something. <laughs> And I used to, later I learned about the placebo effect. I said, he really believed something was going to happen, and it happened. <laughs> now, that's not the way that Jesus heals us. <laughs> but there is a power of faith. Don't underestimate it. There's a lot of people in false religions, and they believe, and things happen. <laughs> Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. So she, she goes in peace. And just as she's leaving, while he's still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and they said, your daughter is dead. After this wonderful testimony and this miracle, Jairus is saying, Lord, please come. She's at the point of death and Jesus stops to talk to this woman. And then they come and they say, don't bother the teacher anymore. It's too late. Now, friends, I'll tell you, I know the feeling of hearing that you've lost a child. And there's no, no words to explain. It's like a freight train hits your whole being. And uh, there's nothing in life that can explain the tsunami of emotions that you feel, the, the utter shock. And I kind of, I can understand a little bit about what J. Iris was experiencing. Jesus saw the expression on his face and his shoulders slump and probably began to heave and, and to sob and Jesus said, do not be afraid. Notice the next words. Only believe. Amen. Don't stop believing. Even in the face of death, even in the face of hopelessness, Jesus does not want us to lose our faith. Amen. So now Christ permits no one to follow him. He dismisses the crowd. Because the crowd, you know, they don't always have the faith. And he brings no one with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and it evidently was a little distance, and from the time that the girl had died, they'd already notified the local mourners in the community, and the neighborhood has gathered to share the sorrow with the family. It says there's a great tumult. They've already hired mourners, and they come in, and they play their doleful sounds on the flutes, and the women are wailing, actually paid mourners. And they'd come in, and they wanted to have good crying, so everyone in the community knew that there was crying, that there was a loss. Great tumult, and those who wept, and they wailed loudly, weeping and wailing. And he came and he said to them, Why do you make this commotion, commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. You know, when someone's sleeping, they're waiting to awake. Just parked, I thought. And they ridiculed him. They said, No, she's dead. We saw the girl. She's, she's dead. No life left. And he put them all outside. Why? You know, when Peter resurrected Dorcas, he evicted everybody. When Elijah raised the boy, he went up there to the room by himself. He didn't let Gehazi go up because Gehazi tried, nothing happened. He said, I don't need nobody in this room that doesn't have faith. Uh, that was bad English, but you got the point. <laughs> and they ridiculed him. He put them all outside. He took the father and the child, the father and the mother of the child, and those who were with him, meaning Peter, James, and John. And he entered where the child was lying. And he took the child by the hand. He touched her. And he said, Talithi kumai. is gentle. Little girl, I rise. The words that Jesus used in Greek, it's something like you might say when you say to your child as they're getting ready for school, Honey, get up. It was tender. It's like school's coming, time to wake up. Little girl, arise. And immediately, the girl arose. She pops up out of bed. 
And it's not like she's going through this convalescent recovery. She jumps up and she's walking around. She is not only healed, she's completely healed. And she gets up and she starts to, to move around. And it says, for she was 12 years of age. Now I just saw that number somewhere else a moment ago. And they were overcome with great amazement. But they commanded, he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that someone should give her something to eat. Now, I want to talk about this story just a little bit now that I've given you the whole panorama. Jesus is en route to resurrect a 12-year-old girl. And along the way, he encounters a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years, which means at the same time that girl was born, the other woman started with her problem. You with me? 12 is a number that typically represents the church. You've got the 12 tribes in the Old Testament. You've got the 12 apostles in the New Testament. You've got the New Jerusalem that has 12,000 furlongs with 12 gates. It's got a tree inside that gives 12 kinds of fruit 12 times a year. On 12 foundations, you have 12 judges. And so you've got this number 12 as a symbol for the church. Revelation chapter 12, not that that means anything, but she's got a, a crown with 12 stars around her head. That woman, it's a church. You get two women in this story. You have one woman who has struggled with a continual flow of blood. She is the older of the two. She represents the Old Testament. There's another girl who's dead and there's a resurrection and that's what brings her story to life. The New Testament begins with the resurrection of Christ. Amen. You realize all the New Testament was written after the resurrection is what I'm saying. They both touched Jesus that day. The Old Testament is something like that woman in, in the Old Testament. How do they deal with sin? They had the sacrificial system and they had a continual flow of blood. I've been to Israel, I've been to the Dome of the Rock where the temple used to be and, and years ago you could go inside. It's a little harder to get in there now but right there they built this Mosque of Omar, this Dome of the Rock on top of the spot where Solomon had his temple. Solomon built his temple on the place they believed that Abraham, Mount Moriah, offered Isaac. And from that holy spot where one time David, when he numbered Israel, Jerusalem was dying off and from that spot David saw an angel with a sword in his hand and he offered a sacrifice that the plague might stop and later he bought that place. He said, this is where the house of God is going to be. God said, I will choose a place. That was the place. They drilled a hole from where that altar was and it went from the altar down to the Kidron Valley, it's still there today, the tunnel. That was meant to carry the blood away down to the Dead Sea. There was a river of blood, a continual flow of blood. But what can wash away my sin? Was it the blood of goats and bulls and lambs and calves? Or nothing but the blood of Jesus? That woman had spent all, but she was no better, only grew worse. Anyone in the Old Testament that was thinking that it was going to be the sacrificial system of animals, that all pointed to the day when they would touch at the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was during the Passover and the temple curtain was ripped from top to bottom indicating that it was no longer that temple. The high priest ripped his garments. New temple, you are a temple of God. New priesthood, you are a holy priesthood. High priest tore his garments, the veil of the temple was rent. That was the moment when these two great economies were separated. The New Testament church was born. That's that girl. He said, give her something to eat. What does God feed us? You know, after the resurrection, every time Jesus appeared to the disciples, it says, He opened the Word, He opened the Word, He opened the Word. He gave her something to eat. They both touched Jesus that day. You know, it, uh, I think sometimes we under, I'll tell you, my parents were not touchy-feely. I remember when I first came to Sacramento Central, uh, we had a few members there that were just really, they just hug, hug everybody and it just, you know, and they could see I was a little like, oh, yeah, how do you do this? <laughs> you know, I just wasn't sure. I didn't, uh, Dad never hugged me. As we got older, I started hugging him whether he liked it or not. But uh, growing up, he didn't have that. And, and uh, they had a Hug Doug campaign to try and help me get the victory. <laughs> and to this day, 
I still remember when I just was starting to date Karen. I mean, we didn't even say we were dating, but for some reason we were in my truck driving to d together and, and uh, we were driving along and we knew that we were spending a little more than normal time together and this might turn into something. And, and while we were driving along, for whatever reason, she reached up her hand and she put it on my shoulder on the back of my neck. I nearly ran off the road. <laughs> you know, she's a physical therapist. So Karen, you know, she's always rubbing people's necks and she, I, I married someone who gives you massages. <laughs> Touch. I still have that truck. It's still on property. Yeah. It hasn't given me near as much trouble though as someone else in the story. <laughs> but When I went to India, oh, come on, I couldn't have just come on. She can take it. When I went to India, and I would see all these people, 1999, they'd come by, and they'd stand there, and they'd go like this. And, I'm going, and then my translator said, they want you to pray for them. And so I'd, I'd start praying, and he said, no, 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 no. Just at first, I'm praying these long prayers. He said, that's not what they want. They want you to bless them. I said, well, how do you do that? He says, you just touch them. Say the name of Jesus and touch them. They went away happy. And I'll tell you, I touched thousands of people. They would just line up. <laughs> and uh, they just wanted you to bless them. It, they, to them, it meant something. They'd go like this. And, and I put my hand on their head. And, you know, it just started moving to me to tears. And so many people came to Jesus, and they just wanted that touch. It meant so much. That touch of faith. And he wants to touch you. Amen. I remember um, not too long after our son died, Micah, I was doing meetings overseas when he passed away. And after we kind of recovered from that blow, we got involved in evangelism, I was doing another overseas trip. And I have trouble sleeping on the plane. And sometimes it gets pretty lonely. You know, you're halfway across the ocean and I'd get up and I'd walk around the plane. You see, everybody's got their little entertainment systems and they're all falling asleep. And it's dark, they got all the lights down and, and I sat down, I opened up my laptop and I had a whole PowerPoint program that I had put together uh, of Micah, all the pictures we had of him from birth until the last time we saw each other. And I was just flipping through him, a handsome young man, he died at uh, 23. And we're flipping through and we're looking at the, the pictures, I'm by myself. I didn't know the flight attendant was behind me. She was doing a check going up the aisles. And she stopped, and I saw her there, and she said, handsome young man, uh, who's that? I said, that was my son. And because of the way I phrased it, she, uh, she said something, and I said, well, we lost him. And she just stood there for a moment, and I didn't, and it created a very awkward moment. And I thought, oh, I didn't mean to embarrass her, make her feel better. But you know what? She just reached over, and she put her hand on my shoulder. <laughs> she didn't say anything. And it was just to say, you know, I just want to put a little love into you. <laughs> the Lord wants to touch you. He knows how you feel. He knows what you've been going through. He knows about your good behavior. He knows about your bad behavior. And He loves you. He wants to touch you and He wants to raise you and give you new life. You got to get through the crowd. Don't let people say you can't do it. Don't let people make you think that he didn't come for you. If the Son will make you free, you'll be in free. Free indeed. Jesus wants to touch you today. He wants to touch you who are watching. You just got to come in faith. Jesus said, if you believe, only believe, your faith has made you whole. That means whosoever. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. You are all qualified, trust me. You just come like you are. And you say, Lord, Will you touch me today? How many of you want to have that touch of Jesus? Can we ask him together as we close? Please bow our heads together. Loving Lord, we just thank and praise you for this promise in your word that, first of all, the whole gospel is in this story. We see the picture of the Old Testament church, a continual flow of blood, grew no better but worse until she touched you. We see the New Testament church dead until you touched her. 
and all came to life through your touch. Lord, we believe your touch is still powerful today and that you want to reach out and touch us. Help us to have that touch of life, that touch of healing, that you might restore us, that we might walk with you. Bless us now. We thank you and pray in Christ's name. Amen.